My name's Blake Manley. I'm a teacher at Sweet Home High School in Forestry and Natural Resources. One of my jobs is to introduce students to career paths that they don't get to see in the everyday classroom. So join me as we shadow professionals working in their everyday jobs. Big one. Beautiful fish. In this episode, Great. we will follow two fish hatchery technicians, Brett and Ryan, as they work at the South San Am Hatchery. They will be spawning and raising fish for the future generations. So join us for another exciting episode right here on Manly Jobs. The biggest female Chinook you could get, so they hold about 43 to 4,500 eggs. So that's kind of our goal, is keep these fish alive and raise a very healthy, lean, mean smolt at the end of the process here. On a cold morning in early December, Brett and the crew prepare for their spawning day. These fish have had one heck of a journey just to arrive here at the Foster Dam. Before we show you the spawning process, let's talk about the journey of these fish. They spend their entire adult lives in the Pacific Ocean. Once the call of nature has fallen upon them, they start this challenging journey. The 247 mile trip starts in the mouth of the Columbia River. At this point, these fish stop feeding. They must use the body fat they have stored to get back to where they have started. Once the fish arrive at the dam, Brett and his crew take over from there. What we see right here is the trap at, wor at work, right? So explain right. kind of this part of the process. Yeah, well the fish have come up the fish ladder. Um, this is what we call our pre-sort pool. So they're basically trapped in this pool. And we use an automated crowder that you see moving right here. Uh, once we get there, we have a braille that's recessed in the bottom of this pool. And we'll lift that braille up and then they will go down a flume, which leads to that same anesthetic tank that we've been working fish out of. The summer, we went through the same process, pulled them out of this pool, sorted them into holding ponds where they have been sitting until now. So what we have here is a fish lock. So in order to get fish from our holding ponds up into the fish sorting area again, we don't want to bring these fish up dry. We want a water to water transfer essentially, except for that short distance they're sliding down the table. And so what we can do is we can crowd fish out of our post sort pools into this chamber down below. And then we can shut the bulkhead entrapping these fish and it has this braille that you just that the fish are dumping off of recessed into the floor and then if we get a good tight seal on that bulkhead um, we have a pump down there and that's what i'm manipulating here with these knobs we can bring these fish 20 feet up in a column of water and then when once we get to the top of the table here um, we can regulate the water to where it stops we're not over spilling into the anesthetic tank and then we can just lift these fish go directly from the water onto the table short distance into the anesthetic tank and it really re reduces the stress, prevents injury. Right. First order of business is sorting. Brent and the crew have already spent time right. sorting out the males. The females must be sorted twice. Right. Here we see special right. guest principal Ralph Brown helping with this process. Right. Some fish are not ready to spawn yet, but a ripe female's eggs are loose in the skein and the fish is ready. Uh, so this is a male steelhead. We've been handling some females. Sometimes we'll throw a male in with the females just to kind of help their development. Kind of, you know, figure there's some hormones and stuff floating around the water. There's a few slight differences that help uh, that allow us to tell the difference from the males and the females, especially on the steelhead. They have a very narrow, slender belly. Um, and they have more of a predominant I guess sharp nose. They tend to be a little darker in color. They get this really pronounced red stripe down their side. This is a female. As I explained with the male, they have definitely more of a predominant sharp nose. We call that a kipe. 
females, uh, sometimes they can have a little bit of that, but definitely it's, it's not as pronounced. Their vent is usually kind of sticking out a ways. They're ready to, to get rid of those eggs. If you look at the belly, um, it's, it's not that narrow, firm belly that a male has. Green. So what we're watching on the other side of these tubes is the sorting. And they sort all the fish that come in, whether it is from the river, from the top trap, or like they're doing right now, getting ready to do their harvest of the eggs and the whole process. These tubes, they go in the ground and they come out in several pools. This pool right here is the one that they're putting the greens in that they're gonna hold back for a little while longer. They're not quite ready. And so the, the other fish as they were sorting, they're gonna go in the next pool. And so when they get ready to process these fish tomorrow, to spawn them out, they won't worry about anything in this pool. They'll just focus on the next pool over, they'll push them and they'll bring them in. Spawning day has arrived. The journey has ended. Brent and the crew are prepared and ready to spawn these fish and complete their life cycle. Step one is working the males and extracting the milt. So we put the fish into the anesthetic tank over there and it takes them about five, 10 minutes ago or so and they get knocked out. Um, it just puts them to sleep, it's non-harmful. After the fish have completely gone out and are anesthetized, um, the guys are grabbing a fish. Um, we're really watching our water. This, this sperm is gonna sit for maybe up to two hours by the time we get some eggs in buckets and start the fertilization process. We're wiping off the bellies of the fish. Be careful not to introduce any water into the sperm cups. Uh, after we get the sperm in the cups, uh, they'll go on ice. And, and then as long as the sperm has oxygen and is kept cold, it can live for many, many hours. Once we get uh, all the sperm taken, then we'll go ahead and crowd some females out and start getting the eggs. It's a female's turn. And this is just a hand disinfectant that we use while spawning. We're just trying to limit anything from happening that might infect the eggs and cause bad fertilization or uh, the juveniles to get it as they grow. All the males have been cleared out of the channel. We brought the females in and um, they've been anesthetized. We want to try to kind of remove water from this process at this time. So all the females are placed on the rack, they're dried off. And then we've got somebody spawning. We have a specialized knife that we use to rip the belly and he's making a, an incision up the belly and removing those eggs. So now we're to the point where we're fertilizing the eggs. Um, each bucket of eggs has two females in it, male from two sperms in these cups that we took initially. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, add the sperm to the egg bucket Make sure I get all of it out of there. And then I'm gonna gently stir that in, making sure that um, we mix it thoroughly and then that the melt has a opportunity to um, get close to each and every egg. Um, like I said, we don't add water in our process here. We allow fertilization to take place in the ovarian fluid. We sit them over to the side. After these eggs have sat here for a couple of minutes, we will just simply pre-mixed solution here. We'll just add that to the eggs and that kind of gives it just a kind of a preliminary disinfection before they get over to the hatch house.
And these are preset to uh, four gallons a minute. They're sitting in the iodine solution for 15 minutes and then their, their treatment will be done. They'll be disinfected. Uh, supply water will go ahead and clean that out and you'll have nice clean, you'll have just nice clean river water flowing through them. After a few months of incubation, the new life begins. Now those eggs incubated for a couple months. Um, they hatched into fry and then we ponded those fry and that's what we have here. We have a couple different stages of fry we want to show you. These have only been ponded for about 10 days to two weeks and they're just starting to learn how to feed. High-end fish oils, fish meals. So we have a small group in here starting out in this trough and then we have our production fish that are in our three larger starter troughs on the other side of the building and those fish have been ponded for about a month and a half and on a warmer water supply. These fish are a cold-blooded animal. Water temperature will affect um, their growth rate and we have a couple different water sources. One of them is from a well that has a warmer water and we can mix those water sources to accelerate the growth. Each year this facility incubates 3.5 million eggs. The process of raising the fish to small stage takes a year and a half. They release 120,000 steelhead here and over 1 million Chinook salmon annually. An additional 120,000 steelhead are raised for the North San Yam River. As the fish grows, they need more room. At that point, they are transferred to the bigger ponds. One of the most important jobs of the technician is to monitor the health and growth of the fish. Here we see the crew doing the first part of that process, weighing and counting. We're looking at about 4.3 to the pound. Our goal is around 4.5. They're nice and they're lean. They're starting to lose some of their scales, which is a sign that they're ready to go to the ocean, that they're smolding. So, so as of right now, they're, they're looking really good. And then we'll see what the size is. The next step is to sample the fish lengths. This is an extremely important data point that the hatchery technicians need to decide on the release dates. So when he's measuring these fish, you can look on the back, there's normally a fin right here, small fin, the adipose fin, and that was removed last summer. And so that's one of the things we'll look for. And, uh, and then he'll call off a length to me. 225. And then we'll keep track of that and we'll, co we'll compare it in relation to the weight of the fish. And that, like I said, that gives us our condition factor. 260. Probably for this whole release, we'll get like 300 lengths um, randomly and what we'll be able to look at is we can look at like size trends between like say 190 and 230 and as you can see our fish are really falling nicely into that category which is telling me as a facility manager that that these fish are they're right at that size where they're ready to go to the ocean and you know we've kind of done our job as hatchery technicians of raising these fish and and getting them ready to make that journey the data collected here is used across the region for many purposes some of those purposes include funding and research. The way we release these fish, uh, we don't want our hatchery fish to linger too long in the river after we release them and compete with the wild stock. What we'll do is we'll start, we call it a volitional release, we'll pull these screens out. These fish can kind of swim out on their own and that can take some time. And so what we'll do is we'll get them a little bit larger prior to release. They have a little more fat in their system to live on because we'll stop feeding. So that's kind of our goal is keep these fish alive <laughs> and, uh, and raise a very healthy, lean, mean smolt at the end of the process here. In order to be a fish hatchery technician, you need to have some post high school education. That can come in two forms. One, a four year biologist degree, or two, you can do an 18 month hatchery tech program at a community college. Here in America, we're blessed with facilities like this. Anglers benefit from it, economics benefits from it, families benefit from facilities just like this. 
My little girls love to go fishing. Without fish hatchery technicians in this occupation, we wouldn't be able to sustain the amount of fishing, recreation, and economics that comes from fish today. And I hope that you continue to support hatcheries just like this one for our future generations.